Our next speaker, Mark Mermelstein. This man has been working with Case of Cares for a few years now. He's actually the man who has been responsible. Do you remember last night? How many people were there last night? How many? Okay, do you remember when I said we were responsible for getting, I think it was three people out of guardianship? Remember that? In six years, we've literally only gotten three people out of guardianship. This man is the man who did it. So, yeah. He's the man who did it. He hails from Oric. He's a rising star attorney. And if you need somebody to really understand what's going on, I'm gonna give you a quick story. When Kathy Braun and first met Mark, he didn't really understand that when we said, look, it's not just somebody saying, hey, somebody's been put in guardianship, it's wrong, we can get them out quickly. We, and we kept saying, no, it, you can't get people out of guardianship quickly. The, the judge isn't gonna let this woman who is 54 years old and completely competent out of guardianship. No matter what you said to him, no matter what doctor said, this judge is not gonna let you. He goes, no, 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 I'm a criminal defense attorney. I deal with people all the time. We're gonna, we're gonna it's fine. He fl flies down, I'm gonna, he's gonna tell the story, but flies down to Florida to get a woman out of guardianship who's completely competent. And he said to me, he goes, I have been treated better by a judge trying to get a murderer off than trying to get somebody out of guardianship. He's got some great stories. I'm glad you're all here. Please welcome Mark Mermelstein. Hello, thank you for uh, thank you for having me. So my name is Mark Mermelstein. I'm an attorney uh, in LA. I'm, I'm really a trial lawyer more than anything else. Try, try uh, criminal cases, civil cases. And uh, what I want to talk about today is frankly what I've been exposed to uh, from having had the pleasure of working with Case and Cares, working with some of the folks in this room uh, over the last couple of years. And it was, it has been an eye-opening experience. I could not have appreciated what I was getting into. And Terry's right. It, it, it has been an eye-opening experience and I wanted to uh, get into today some of those stories uh, and some of what I've observed. Frankly, I fancy myself really an outsider coming to this issue uh, in the last couple of years and, and really seeing uh, and having some, uh, some observations about uh, some of the, what I've seen from, from the front lines of the elder fraud uh, war. And, you know, as I go through this, this is very informal. Um, questions, comments along the way, please uh, speak up, uh, raise your hand. I'm happy to, uh, to take comments uh, along the way. And the reason I call it more lessons is I did have the pleasure of speaking with some of you last year, and uh, these are some, some additional additional observations. Uh, I did want to give a little bit of background here as to how I got into one of the tools when you get into these cases is bringing it to the criminal authorities. And that in and of itself, what I call a criminal referral, uh, as opposed to a situation where you're going into court and filing a civil lawsuit or you're uh, you're, you're having a guardianship fight in civil court. In some of these cases, it's worth thinking about a criminal referral. And this experience with this, uh, with this painting, if anyone recognizes it, it's a painting by, uh, by Pablo Picasso. Or at least my client thought it was a painting by Pablo Picasso. When he bought it, he paid uh, $2 million for this from a gallery in LA on La Cienega Street. And um, when uh, the recession hit, this is a couple of years back, he had it appraised because he wanted to borrow against it. And I think you guys know, if you're ahead of me, you know how the story goes. He had it appraised, not at the hand of Pablo Picasso. So the question was, what does he do now that he has this painting that's uh, not worth the $2 million that he paid for. 
And so the question really was, what do we do with this? He came to me, and I think the, the civil litigator in me would say, well, let's file a lawsuit, sue the gallery. But then we do some research on the gallery owner. Turns out there's, uh, they do own the gallery itself, which is a good thing. Uh, there's some real property there. Uh, but there's some liens on the property. And they have some inventory of other paintings that are worthwhile, but they're all movable. And so the process of the civil litigation suing the gallery probably would have not yielded anything. We could have chased it for three, four years, gotten a judgment, it would have looked really nice on paper, but would we have ever collected? And instead, what we did was we brought it over to the federal prosecutor, the US Attorney's Office. And one of my colleagues at the US Attorney's Office, who before law school, she was the curator for the Getty Museum. She loved this case. Much more, much more interesting than the uh, accounting fraud that she was otherwise tasked with prosecuting. This was art fraud. This was what prosecutors call sexy stuff. <laughs> she worked nights, she worked weekends. She, working with the FBI, tracked down the woman that had painted the painting and was paid $5,000 to paint this painting that uh, the gallery then sold to my guy for $2 million. Bucks. And the, the painter turned state's evidence. She was willing to testify. And so what the government had was their criminal intent. They were able to prove that the gallery owner knew that when she was selling the painting, that she knew it was a fake. Because you can't buy something for 5000 and sell it for $2 million and think that it's, that it's a legitimate uh, painting. The government goes in. They execute a search warrant at the same time as they're going in to arrest. And one of the things they do is they have, the government has asset forfeiture powers, which allow them to seize other assets of the, uh, of the defendant if they can trace it to, uh, to the criminal proceeds. And what they've been able to establish with this painting, anyone know who painted this? Any art uh, folks? This is a uh, jacuning. This is actually a legitimate jacuning that was uh, in the gallery and had been purchased with the proceeds of the two million bucks that my guy put up. And so when they went in, they were able to seize this de Kooning painting. And ultimately, I get a call from one of my colleagues in the criminal defense bar who is representing the gallery owner. And he says to me, what can we do to make this right? And so now, instead of on the civil side where I'm chasing the gallery, I'm chasing them to pay my guy money. I have the criminal defense attorney who's representing the gallery owner chasing me to pay restitution because we've created a situation where there's something that the gallery owner fears more than money, and that's her liberty. And there's two ways the sentencing can go, right? I can come into sentencing on behalf of my client, the victim here, and I can say, this woman, this gallery owner, is the worst of the worst. She cheated my guy out of two million bucks, in which case the judge is, is likely to give a pretty healthy uh, jail sentence. Or I can go in a different approach, say, judge, you know, this uh, woman took two million of my, my client's money, but she made it right. She made paid restitution. She uh, agreed not to contest the forfeiture of the de Kooning, so my guy could get the proceeds on that. She dismissed a couple of liens on the, the, the real property, and so the, the property could be sold, and my guy could get the uh, proceeds of that. Long story short, we cut a deal with the gallery owner and ended up getting my guy back in terms of restitution $2.3 million on the $2 million outlier, which there's just no way that ever would have happened on the civil side. Fraud victims, so there are folks in here that know this well, fraud victims typically get about five or 10 cents on the dollar in terms of recovery. And so this was just one of those moments where the right situation 
fell into place and was able to get for my guy uh, uh, more than 100% recovery. That was headlines. Sorry. Now, why do I talk about that here? Why do I uh, start with that? Because some of the lessons from the that experience in terms of getting the prosecutor involved, getting a criminal prosecutor involved, translate really well to some of the situations that you all have been exposed to that I've uh, gotten involved in. You have situations where you can have an elder that has been the victim of abuse, and you have a question of whether this is something uh, I should sue civilly and try to get redress that way, whether I should be going to uh, the licensing folks, APS, and try to tackle it that way, or whether I should be getting a prosecutor involved and uh, trying to tackle it that way. And those, to me, are the different, some of the different avenues, depending on the situation, depending on the case, that uh, one can look to. And so that's some of the things that I want to uh, that I want to get into uh, into today. And the way I'll structure it, uh, in terms of Carrie's uh, father had a top forty, I have a, a top seven. I can only come up with seven. I couldn't actually come up with forty lessons uh, from, uh, from from in, in what I've learned in this short time, uh, having been uh, been in this fix. So, number seven, tread carefully behind enemy lines. This is one of those situations that uh, Carrie was alluding to. I had the pleasure of meeting Kathy and Carrie uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, they said we had a situation in Florida where a competent woman has been declared incompetent. And I said, how is that possible? And they said, it happened. I said, yes, but how is it possible? And started looking into the situation. It was a situation where dad passes, there's three, uh, three daughters, and two of them gang up on the third one. And uh, in order to essentially keep her from getting her inheritance, they uh, teamed up, they went into court, and uh, they got her declared incompetent and they got a uh, guardian appointed for her, a professional guardian that gets paid from her money or the money that she would otherwise have received. Uh, and you know, how does this happen in America? I'm still not sure how it happened. But it, it was a crazy situation. So you have, I'm, I'm, I'm going into court here, and I'm trying to figure out how did this happen? So what you have is a situation, Florida has a law that says three, uh, three mental health professionals, three professionals, I should say, need to, need to sign off on the fact that the person is not competent. On the three, on the three folks that looked at this, nobody had any mental health experience. The most experienced person was the gynecologist. Yes. <laughs> the, uh, the, 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 the ward here had basically fought the process. She just didn't, uh, she just couldn't believe this was happening. She was hostile to the process. And so rather than these people writing a report to the court that said this ward is hostile to the process, I mean, who wouldn't be, right? They just checked all the boxes for all the, uh, for all the incompetencies. And the process got started. Uh, Florida appoints for you uh, a guardian at litem to represent your interests. Guardian at litem just didn't appear to be particularly excited about uh, getting this thing done. I don't know if it's because he receives some money the longer the uh, process goes but he was just not interested. He didn't come to the table with the same outrage that perhaps uh, all of us in this room uh, would have about that type of situation. Then there's uh, the lawyer for the 
The two sisters, he's getting paid from the, uh, the guardianship fund, uh, from this pot of money. Uh, then you have the, the, the guardian who's getting paid. Nobody seems to want this to end. I mean, that's really the problem. Everyone's feeding at the trough. And the idea that there is a competent woman that has been declared incompetent doesn't seem to, uh, didn't seem to outrage uh, people. So to make matters worse, uh, they said to her, you need to go see this particular uh, doctor. She refused. So the judge issued a warrant for her arrest to force her to be arrested and brought to the doctor. And so she, uh, you know, what, what I would call in my criminal defense days, took, used her jurisdictional defense. She got up and, and uh, flew to California, where she uh, had met Kathy and Carrie, and, and they got me involved, and that's sort of, that was all the background. So I get involved in this, I look at this, and I go to Florida, and I said, as Terry said, this should be pretty easy. I mean, we can all agree this person, there's a terrible miscarriage of justice here. You'd think this should be straightforward. I had uh, my uh, psychologist, who I've used for competency issues over the years, um, do an evaluation of this competent woman, so I get to have a 20-page single-spaced report uh, basically doing quantitative testing, qualitative testing, to be able to submit to the judge. And I, I come in there and I hand in my report and I say, Judge, we should all be, should all be outraged here. We have, a, a, this is a terrible miscarriage of justice. And the judge looks at me and he says, you need a Florida doctor to uh, declare that she's uh, competent. I said, but judge, I've been trying for a month to get a Florida doctor to come to LA to examine her. I can't get that done. And because you've issued an arrest warrant, I can't get my client to come back to Florida to see a Florida doctor. So if you would maybe have the courtesy of lifting the arrest warrant, then I could do that. And he says, yeah, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> so I'm standing there in court. <laughs> I say, to the judge, is there not some degree of responsibility something for the situation that we all find ourselves in as officers of the court. We should all be outraged by this. And he said, Mr. Mermelstein, it's your motion. What would you like to do? Would you like me to rule on the motion? Would you like to withdraw the motion? What would you like to do? And so that's what I had said to Carrie. I've been treated better uh, in California uh, in, in, uh, in cases where my client has been accused of uh, substantial, substantial wrongdoing. Ultimately, uh, I literally couldn't get, there were so many institutional interests that wanted to keep that guardianship going. Uh, I could not get things done in Florida. And the only thing I could do was transfer the guardianship to California. Even then, the person, because my client had been stripped of her legal rights, she was actually not able to file a motion to transfer the guardianship because she didn't have the legal authority to do that, the legal standing to do that. And so I had to threaten the lawyer for the, uh, the, lawyer for the guardian for him to bring that motion um, to, to bring the case to California. We got into a courtroom in LA and we got the thing uh, dismissed uh, in about five minutes. So what was impossible in Florida was, was routine in LA. Wow. That was, uh, that was eye opening.
threatened him with? I, I threatened him with, uh, I guess my argument was that he had put himself in a situation where he had a ward in California and he had a guardian in Florida. And there was no way that the guardian in Florida could be fulfilling her legal responsibilities of oversight with a ward 3,000 miles away. Um, and that, that was just a recipe for disaster because, you know, it's essentially guardianship malpractice, if, you know, to the extent there is such a thing. Um, but, you know, tricky situation because I don't know if my client even has standing to file that because she's been stripped of all of her rights. Uh, so it's a very complicated situation when you've been, when you've been stripped of, uh, when you've been stripped of your rights. Uh, anyway, got done. So, tread carefully behind uh, enemy lines. It's, uh, it's hostile territory. Process, and then there's this thing called justice that, that we all like to think uh, is at the heart of, uh, of everything we do in court. And here I had the law on my side, I had the justice on my side, and I still couldn't get it done. It was, uh, it was eye-opening. And, and I really think that the, the lesson there um, was that this was just a situation where everyone in the courtroom benefited from the continued guardianship. Everyone's money, everyone benefited financially, uh, and the status quo just remained. And uh, that was uh, that was truly an eye-opening experience. situation in New York. And uh, the rule there is no good deed goes unpunished. So this was a situation where there had been a, there was a family in New York, uh, upstate New York, um, and uh, a uh, two, uh, two, two daughters, one ill, uh, from mom's uh, funeral, one of the daughters who is ill is taken by an attorney and proceeds to uh, sign a will 
uh, coming directly from her mom's funeral. And uh, she signs her half of uh, mom's estate over to the attorney's wife. You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> no, it's, it's a lot of that. You can't make this stuff up. So, we want the stories to be the answer. This is the easiest question you can ask me. <laughs> so, Carrie decides, Carrie learns about the situation, and Carrie decides she's going to bring some attention to this matter, some use her, uh, her public voice to bring some attention to this matter. she's going to bring her uh, her public voice to this and she goes out to New York and they have a, uh, a forum where folks are invited in to learn about the situation a little bit because there were two daughters one has signed her uh, estate uh, over to the attorney's wife and the estate they both all call the two daughters uh, both own a uh, hotel in, uh, in New York, and so now, once the once the daughter passes, you have the family uh, owning half the hotel and the attorney's wife owning the other half of the hotel, which is uh, kind of a recipe for disaster. And the attorney very nicely says, "Yeah, you can buy me out. You can buy me out of my half share." And, and get back your family uh, family hotel for uh, for a rather significant fee. So Carrie says, you know what? I'm going to bring some public attention to this, and, and goes uh, goes to New York and has uh, uh, a gathering where they talk about the uh, talk about the issues. And uh, sure enough, Carrie uh, gets sued for defamation for having said things which were entirely true. But defamation laws in New York are different than they are in California. So this, is, this would have been protected speech in California. But the New York laws are, uh, New York laws are a little bit different. And uh, so we spend uh, the better part of uh, the winter in, uh, in upstate New York dealing with this defamation lawsuit. And the, uh, I think the highlight of that case was Carrie coming in for her deposition, and she says, well, can I get sued again for what I say in the deposition? And I say, no, what you say in the deposition is covered by the litigation privilege, right? So even though what you said at that, that gathering was not protected and you're being sued for that, what you say in the deposition Entirely protected. You, you cannot you cannot get sued for defamation for what you say in court or what you say in a uh, in a deposition that's essentially a, a, a court like uh, proceeding. She says, "Great, let me go." And I said, "But do you really want to do this?" And she says, "Absolutely." And then she says, "Is it going to be videotaped?" Because most of my clients don't really want to be videotaped. <laughs> And I said, I don't know, it depends if the, it's the other side that does the videotaping, it depends if they want to spend the money or not. She says, no, no, I want to videotape it. <laughs> first time ever, I've been doing this more than 20 years, first time ever, we had two videographers at the position. The other side had their video guy, we had our video guy, because we didn't trust that their video guy was actually going to uh, going to properly video the, uh, the deposition. And um, in addition to laying out all of the reasons why she wasn't subject to, uh, to New York jurisdiction, she 
very eloquently explained the five prior situations that this attorney had been involved in, all of which smacked of uh, elder fraud, elder abuse, and went meticulously through the documents and just one by one by one explained each of those five situations and how given that history of those five situations that tended to support her view that the, the situation that we were then involved in, uh, that her statements were actually true and they weren't uh, defamatory. And I'm gonna add something. Sure. <laughs> okay. This is, hey. And you're only, you're only getting, oh wow, sorry about that, a little bit of this story because this guy terrorized the entire town and the, the family that I'm helping has pretty much won most of it, at least they still have some litigation, but this this guy, this I just have to tell this story real quick, this guy, after we got the media attention on him, not only was I on radio shows and news, they had, I mean, they were in upstate New York, the Catskills, they had I mean, they started getting TV news programs. So this one lady decides she's gonna do an investigative report on this guy. So she's trying to find him, you know, like it's kind of like searching for him. And they find him in the town's ice cream shop. And this guy, it's hot, he's got a blazer on, a green shirt, and he's walking out. <laughs> no joke, I mean, literally with his ice cream. And she starts to talk to him, and then she realizes what's on his shirt. And this guy's so pompous, he's wearing a shirt that says, a good lawyer knows the law, a great lawyer knows the judge. <laughs> I had to get that, this guy was a real bad guy, real bad guy, so thank you Mark for getting me out of that situation. <laughs> Justice was done. We ended up getting, Carrie got to speak her mind, got to speak the truth, as she always does, and uh, we were able to get that, uh, that lawsuit dismissed. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. And if I could get this to work, that would be great. situation where dad has lived his entire life in, uh, in New Mexico and uh, there's a New Mexico daughter, there's another daughter that has moved to Idaho and the Idaho side of things managed to engineer a situation to bring dad to Idaho. So 93 years in New Mexico and uh, he's uh, in Idaho and Idaho daughter files for guardianship over dad, essentially to try to lock in the results of having exclusive access to dad, who is a dementia sufferer, and um, at that stage in life probably would have signed most anything uh, just to be continued, uh, continued care uh, from anyone. So what this sets up is essentially a guardianship uh, contest. Who's going to be the guardian? Is it going to be the, uh, the New Mexico daughter, or is it going to be the Idaho daughter? So this was the key. This case ends up going to uh, trial. This was the key document in the case. This, and you would think, let's, let's go through it. Initially, Pleasant, cooperative, seemed somewhat confused regarding exact details of persons and events. His daughter and grandson were conversing with him regarding family history and was showing him an ancestry scrapbook that she had made for him. During the conversation, Jose became upset, progressively agitated, stating that he wanted to go back to New Mexico and that his family here was keeping him captive. 
you would think that that was a document that had surfaced you know, right at trial time and everyone would be shocked to understand that this uh, elder was saying that he had been held captive. No, this document had been around the entire case. This was the first visit by the, this was the first report, the first visit by the court visitor. There was no outrage. This was the same situation that I had seen in Florida where there are facts, you look at the facts, you look at all the people in the courtroom, and they're not responding to the facts the way you think they should respond to the facts, right? So you have a court visitor who's interviewing uh, this gentleman. There's a whole bunch of family around. He's saying that he's being held captive, but nobody's asking for more detail. The next. You know, when asked, he states he doesn't need help from anyone, he's capable, it, it just moves on to a different topic. It's like nobody appreciated that there's a problem here, which is pretty shocking, right? So uh, we end up uh, going to trial, and I think the other side really wanted to present it as kind of what's best for dad. Is he better off in New Mexico or is he better off in Idaho? And they're trying to make the point that in Idaho he has more support, he has more family, uh, and so he should just be in Idaho because that's either that's our judgment as to what's best for him or that's what's most convenient for the uh, for the kids and uh, my trial strategy on that one was really more of it's not really about what we think is best for that it's about what he wants and his autonomy and his very human right to choose uh, where he wants to live and if we're going to strip someone of their rights, you know, there's just no authority to, to strip someone of their rights. It's the same as putting someone, uh, it, it's the same as, as, as what happened in Florida, where we just stripped that woman of her legal rights. Here, we'd be to, to move this guy or keep this guy in, in Idaho is really to strip him of his right to choose where he wants to live. I mean, he's saying pretty clearly right here uh, where he where he wants to live. The other thing that was super helpful in that case were some recordings of what uh, of, of Jose talking to his daughter and actually expressing uh, in his own words uh, what he what he wants. And so the judge was able to hear from him through these recordings uh, what he what he actually wanted, which I thought was. Pretty interesting because I came across a uh, a conference that uh, folks at Case and Cares uh, turned me on to, and one of the main pieces of advice from one of the speakers at that conference was never videotape the elder. And if this works, we're going to play that. When I do have a witness and this often comes out in the hospital or if they're going there late at night, they're turning down the markings or some kids coming in the night to sign something. And um, you're, you're notarizing your signature and you're probably going to turn the morning back up and they may not make it until the morning. What do you do or did either of you do an execution ceremony differently? Yes. Rule number one, never video. <laughs> ever, ever. Uh, and as we were talking in the green room, um, every, uh, every case I've ever served as an expert witness in, um, there was a question about uh, the confidence of the testator and the video was used in the family. family took the video to demonstrate the confidence the jury was convinced by that video that the testator was incompetent. So rule one, don't 
if you can make out the audio, but there were two, two things, uh, two points that were made there. One, if you want to get the elder to sign something and they're on morphine, you can just turn down the morphine a little bit, get them to sign something, and then turn back up the morphine. The other point was, if you're in a situation where there's a will contest or something, the question was, um, would you ever have videotape of the elder so that if there's a will contest, you could actually play the video, and then the court or whoever could see what the elder's wishes actually were, or could actually could hear from the elder, could uh, assess the, the mental uh, capability of the elder. And the advice was never videotape the elder because it just creates evidence that may not be uh, to your liking. What was the first thing that she said about morphine? Yes, I, I, I actually just. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, it was uh, the first thing about the morphine was uh, if you're uh, if someone is ill and you're trying to get some a document signed, uh, how do you uh, go about doing that? Do they lack uh, testamentary intent or lack the capacity to sign a document? And so the the advice that she was giving was, well, you turn down the morphine a little bit. So this person who's been on morphine for a while, turn down the morphine a little bit. And in that brief interlude, get them to sign something, then turn the morphine back up. Well, I, have to, I have to let you guys know, this is the probate lawyer of my dad's. Hold on, I'm going to give you the mic. Okay. I'm going to say this one. Yeah, no, please. Most of you have heard my case so far about my dad. This tape actually came from my brother who taped this woman, the probate lawyer of my dad's, that did all of this to him and took his money in the end when he died. They got all of his estate. She was teaching, uh, this was a national conference for probate attorneys. And she was teaching this. And when she made this comment about the morphine, everybody laughed. All of these attorneys in there laughed. So this is being taught to attorneys, just like the guardians are being taught how to steal money from our elderly. And I just needed to say this because this really upset me. This was from my case. And I'm the one that helped Lori in New Mexico. Uh, she called me first. She was never told that the sister had her. She was told that dad was going away for two weeks on vacation. And that sister took her. And Lori called Case and Cares and said, you know, um, I can't find my father. I don't know where he is. My sister won't answer the phone call, she won't tell me where he is, blah, 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 blah. So, and this is how we got Mark, Mark involved in this. And this sister was evil. What happened to her was evil. She was the one that was made out. Mark was talking about how um, this, this, it was between two sisters. Well, the one sister was never even told that she was being filed for guardianship. She found out by accident that there was gonna be a guardianship hearing. And thank God she was able to get up there in time for the hearing. And then Mark was able to help her but I needed to, to say oh. that. Yes, so. Was that, did you say that was a national conference? Or? Yes, yes. It was a national conference for probate attorneys in Seattle, Washington. And she was one of the speakers. Can you turn her into the bar? Uh, I, I have not. Uh, I mean, look, maybe. No, they did not. No one turned her into the bar. Because she was teaching. Well, people that have gone up against this like kind of crew, there's a few of them, there's five of them. They've done this to five of their families. They've fleeced everything, all the money. Anybody who goes up against them to try and get justice, it's been disbarred. Yep. Yeah. The, the good probate attorneys what? in yeah. Washington State that try to. They, 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 no, no, they've been disbarred trying to actually go after them. Right. That's yeah. why the good probate attorneys that want to help people will turn the other way. They'll refuse to take your case and say, we'll never win. And you're going, well, why? And we had to look, I had to look out of the city to find an attorney to take our case because they will turn the other way. They will not look, they're terrified of losing their job or losing their licenses. They're being threatened by these bad attorneys saying, we're going to take your license. And now they've maneuvered themselves in on the board, the state boards to take control of the boards and use that, you know, we don't talk against other lawyers. 
and the good lawyers are too afraid because when they do, they lose their licenses and they're threatened. So, Robert Crawford is from Washington State. If you have any questions about what's going on up there, and in, this is happening everywhere, he's a great person to talk to about it. So just to finish what happened, and we gotta keep our, our, our cases straight here, uh, <laughs> but uh, to finish what happened in Idaho, so this case went to trial uh, on this guardianship dispute. Who should be the guardian? Should it be the New Mexico daughter uh, or should it be the Idaho daughter? And we did not follow the advice of this uh, probate lawyer. Uh, we had recordings of what the elder uh, wanted. And Jose spoke clearly and eloquently on these recordings over multiple uh, weeks. So this wasn't a, a moment where we turned down the morphine and got him to say what we wanted him to say uh, and then quickly turned back up the morphine. This was a situation where it was repeated over many, many weeks and it was consistent. It was, hey, I want to go back to New Mexico. Uh, that's where I grew up. I lived 93 years there. And you know what? They have homes. They have nursing homes in New Mexico. Um, and just because the kids, out of convenience, wanted dad in Idaho, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't mean they get to override dad's uh, will. And uh, of course, where the elder is located typically means those are the people that are being able, able to take money out of, uh, out of the estate. So there's a financial uh, impact uh, as well. That one uh, came out the right way, and we were able to get uh, Jose home uh, for the last few weeks uh, of his life. What allowed you to record legally? Was this in a recording state? We've had questions here in the conference about the late legal and recording states. Uh, well, he. Um, Can you repeat the question? Yeah, the question was what allowed us to record? Um, and I think the, the answer is that it was of his own free will. Um, so uh, he was sufficiently with it that he consented. Uh, so this wasn't a situation where uh, it was recorded surreptitiously. This was, Dad, let's sit down. Uh, we're going to talk about a few things. I think this is really important. Um, if, uh, if we end in court here, and if there's a court proceeding coming up uh, with, respect to, uh, with respect to where you live, uh, you know, tell, tell me, where would you like to live? And they were open-ended questions. It wasn't a, you know, here's some food, say what you need to say, and I'll give you uh, your, your sustenance. This was, these were open-ended questions. You could hear it on the recording. Very simple, straightforward. What do you want? And say, I want to go home. Of course, I want to go home. And and those recordings, um, not it wasn't clear that we were actually going to get those recordings into evidence. By the way, there was an evidentiary issue uh, with respect to those recordings because technically they're hearsay; they're out of court statements, um, and and nobody really wanted to bring Dad to court uh, and have him testify in court, which would have been. Uh, a pretty difficult situation, much like when you have a custody dispute with a minor child, nobody really wants to bring the, the, a very young child uh, into court to have to sort of choose between mom and dad. Um, but it was very interesting because the judge really wanted to hear from, uh, from Jose. And uh, it was very clear, the other side would have been very, it would have been very awkward for them to be fighting with the judge to not hear these recordings, right? Because the whole proceeding is about deciding what, what dad wants or what's in dad's best interest. And so for the other side to take the position that the, ordering, the, the recordings were not sufficiently reliable that, should, that they should come into court uh, would have been a very difficult situation for them to take because it would have been perceived that they were, that they were hiding the truth, right? Uh, so we got the recordings in, judge uh, came out the right way, and we were able to get, uh, to get, to get Jose home. <coughs> so, what uh, other... 
other lessons uh, here. And this goes back, wisely choose your weapon, criminal versus civil versus regulatory. And this goes back to uh, a little bit about the art fraud that uh, I started with. In most of these cases, there's a question of how to attack the uh, situation. All the situations are different, and obviously they all need to be evaluated on, uh, on their own merits. But the, it's worth recognizing that there are different options. So uh, we've had a uh, situation, uh, this, is, this is Kathy's uh, situation, where um, you had, uh, Kathy, if I'm free to, okay. uh, a situation where uh, Kathy's dad had substantial uh, amount of money, eight figures of uh, money, and had set up an estate um, where uh, most of the money was going to charities, some of the money was going to his family. But that was what he had wanted, what he had set up. And then uh, late in life, he had a series of folks that managed to surround him and really isolate the family. And once the isolation took place, uh, there was a domestic partnership that was signed under questionable circumstances. And so that meant that a substantial amount of that estate would go to uh, the new uh, quote unquote girlfriend, whatever, whatever that was. But they, they really just surrounded him, and um, by the end, uh, none of that money, none of that money went to either the charities or the family. We still don't know where it went. We have some theories as to where it went, uh, but it didn't go to the places uh, where he had wanted it to go after living his entire life and uh, putting down on paper uh, where he wanted it to go. And the question there was really, um, what's, what's the approach? Uh, I had, uh, Kathy had, had fought a, a good fight on the civil side that was already, that had really been resolved uh, before I got involved. And uh, my efforts were to bring this to a federal uh, criminal prosecutor. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, that did not work out. And some good stories early. Uh, this story does not have a happy ending. Um, the, the prosecutors, the case to be built was a case of fraud. It was a case where these folks had defrauded uh, Kathy's dad into change signing a, a new estate plan uh, late in life. And the prosecutors were really reluctant to bring a fraud case um, where the victim wasn't uh, able to testify because he had passed. And we didn't have the recordings. What would have made that case different? If we had had recordings uh, of, uh, of that, that really could have shown, uh, shown the prosecutor what what his state was like. The, issue, the other issue there is they were falsified medical records. And so when you have falsified medical records, it's very hard for someone to go back and reconstruct what was his actual mental state at any given time, because you don't know which records uh, you can rely on and the other side can point to uh, records. And so there was this factual question about what his uh, actual mental acuity was. And so recordings might have uh, might have swung that one uh, differently. And so with each, with each of these cases, you really need to think through um, what is the best way to, uh, to proceed forward. Why well, choose your soldier? I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. These cases are complicated. Uh, they're, they're, 
historically, there haven't been that many litigators that really entered the guardianship space. Uh, probate lawyers were lawyers who, uh, for the most part, you know, sat in an office and, and wrote the will. They weren't folks that went to court. Um, and uh, I, when I was asked to go to Florida and litigate a case, and I was asked to go to Idaho and litigate a case, I said, surely there must be someone in Florida that can do this. And surely there must be someone in Idaho uh, that can do this. And uh, our search uh, did not find uh, folks who were sufficiently talented, and that's how I ended up uh, going to uh, Go, go into these uh, to Collier County in uh, west west coast of uh, west coast of Florida and uh, Idaho and uh, uh, Seattle and, and a number of places to get involved in, uh, in cases like this. The other thing I, I will say is uh, to win these wars, it's not just about the attorney; it's a team effort. You have uh, investigators. You can have the, the, the client who is. Uh, generating evidence by way of recordings. Uh, it's, really, it's really a team effort to, to put together a case like this and, and, and win something that you would think, hey, this should be pretty straightforward. We have an incompetent person who's been declared, we have a competent person that's been declared incompetent. Should be pretty straightforward. We have a guy that's lived 93 years in New Mexico. Should be pretty straightforward to get him home. But it's uh, the one takeaway here is that it's, it's just not necessarily that straightforward. And that's, I think, been a, a feature of trial law for uh, since we've been doing trials, that uh, it, uh, it doesn't necessarily come out the way that you would think uh, it should come out. And the one thing I, my last point here, is really that it's a war out there. This is what I've learned in the last three, four years getting involved in uh, these types of cases. I was shocked to learn when I got involved in these cases that parents have a right to visit their child, parents who are separated, right? Both parents have the right to, uh, to custody time with their child. Carrie knows this well. There's no adult, uh, there was no adult visitation, right? Uh, up until uh, a couple of years ago. Okay. As a child, you don't automatically have a right to visit, uh, visit your parent. I couldn't believe that when I started to think about what that means. And I've seen it play out in a number of situations with Olivia over here, Kathy with Carrie. That visitation, uh, right of visitation, is incredibly important. And so the work that Case and Cares is doing on that front uh, is, is tremendously uh, valuable. A couple other things that I've uh, come to learn. The guardianship process is flawed. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Just, it's just a process that uh, it's just not working. We have... We <laughs> There's too many people that have a financial incentive to keep the guardianship going. And nobody's looking out for, for the elder, right? You have the guardian that's getting paid with the ward's money to manage the ward's uh, finances, right? Where's the incentive to say that, hey, this person is no longer in need of a guardianship, or this person is healthy, or this person needs a lower level of care. There is no incentive. The incentive is always to increase the expenditure, uh, and then the guardian takes a cut of that at each, at each turn. And I think really the biggest disappointment for me as historically I was a public defender, so I was the guy down in the trenches in East LA, and 
uh, basically I walked away from uh, a blue chip law firm to go be a public defender. And when I was a public defender, I, I gave it my all. It didn't matter to me that I was, you know, wasn't getting paid what I had uh, previously been paid at a law firm. I had committed to this and I, and I wanted to do this. And there's some very committed public defenders uh, who are defending folks who are accused of some, some not so good stuff. The parallel here is we have these guardians at Lightroom who are paid uh, and they're, they're paid by the court or paid uh, from the ward's money to, to represent the ward. And not saying all guardian at Lightroom are bad, but this one in Florida, just that, that would be the call to arms. The, 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 the pride of a, uh, a criminal defense attorney is when you have the innocent client, right? That's when you're gonna fight the fight to free your innocent client. The parallel would be a situation where you had a, uh, a, 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 a competent person having been declared incompetent. And you would expect that guardian ad litem to be pounding the table. Well, that just wasn't happening. How could that be that this person wasn't pounding the table to, to free uh, free his his competent client? Why was there even a need for me to go to Florida to uh, handle that situation? The ward already had a lawyer, but really wasn't. Um, getting the job done. So, what uh, questions, comments uh, that folks have? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Venus. Oh, you are a breath of fresh air. There are not many. Hold on, hold on, Venus. Hold on. Thank you. <laughs> oh, my name is Venus. There are not, I've never heard an attorney Speak what you're speaking right now. Right, Rick? Have you heard that? No. No, I haven't. I'm just asking. Because I'm in Northern California, in Alameda County. We have the same problem. We don't know who's in bed together. We've got judges. We've got legal assistance for seniors. We've got fiduciaries, conservators. And they're criminals. And it's just hard to prove. Because they're the judge. They're the court. They're the law. So, I mean, how do you stay abreast? How do you survive being an attorney saying what you're saying? Well, I would say I'm an outsider, right? I'm not beholden to anyone in the process for my income. I'm a trial lawyer. So next week I'm trying a, a civil case. Uh, in three months I have a criminal case that I'm going to trial on. So I'm not beholden to anyone in the probate uh, system for referrals. Or, or anything like that. Uh, the problem, right? And that's part of the problem is you have lawyers, you have guardians, professional guardians that are all sort of uh, in bed with one another, uh, either corruptly or it, just as a, a function of it's a referral network and they don't want to do anything to get crossed with their referral source. Um, so I'm an outsider there. Troy is uh, is an outsider uh, here. There there are there are some good folks, and what I would say is the folks at Case and Cares are really positioned to know who knows what they're doing and uh, and not right. They have just a broader because they look at so many cases, right? They're in a position to know. Uh, who who is uh, who's on the right side of things? So I'd say whenever you're getting involved in, in these situations, give uh, Carrie or Julie Belshi a call and, uh, and talk it through, and uh, you get the benefit of their uh, wisdom, what they've uh, the information that they've acquired over the last number of years uh, doing this. In regards to uh, Kathy's case, um, if major changes are uh, made in an estate plan, why wouldn't the court be required to examine all parties, including and especially the executive? Uh, you would hope. 
the really the situation is the burden, so the default assumption is that the last uh, will, last uh, trust that was signed is valid unless someone can prove that it's invalid. And so it's not a question of the judge looking at everything and trying to figure out uh, uh, what he, what the, uh, the student would have wanted. It's really much more about trying the, the, the folks who have been aced out. So the people that have been disinherited are the ones coming forward saying, hey, that relationship, that estate that was signed uh, is not enforceable because of X, Y, and Z. And it's super hard to do because dad's not there, mom's not there. And it's, it's a pretty heavy burden to convince the judge that you know, what someone, someone appears to have signed um, is not actually valid. And that's, that's really the hardest part. Add to that, um, the big, like he said about my father being ill or not being ill, that played a big part because the doctor that was corrupt over my father had two sets of records and he tells some people my dad had dementia and other people, no, he's perfectly healthy, he's fine. We tried to get guardianship of my father before he died and um, and that was the, the big thing he was telling, he told the guardian, of, or he wrote a letter to the guardian of the saying my dad, this is a week before my dad died, he said, my dad was in perfect health. He was handling his own finances. He was perfectly fine. Well, he, we also found out that my dad told the, gar uh, the guardian lineup that he couldn't read. He had been able to read since 2006. And that they would, he kept saying, why does he keep making, write, making me write checks with all these zeros? Because zero means nothing. I mean, does that come from someone that's healthy? You know, so we knew that my dad had been diagnosed with Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's just like Carrie's father um, in 2008. And, um, and these people went to his other doctor appointment. My dad's the one who told us this, and they kept claiming, his doctor said, oh no, you don't have that. You don't have that. You're, you're fine. Nothing's wrong with you. That so, was, so that, sorry, it's so loud, sorry. It was so they could get him to sign everything over. Right. So the doctor was in on it. Because if he's competent, he can sign everything over to these five people who now have million dollar houses have stolen 70 or 80 million. None of the nunneries got the money. None of his alma, alma mater had five million dollars. They didn't get any of that. Nobody got anything. The money's gone, and she doesn't know where her father is. So we've got to uh, wrap this up. I want to thank you, Mark Ormelstein. Thank you so much for making light of this. I'm not making light of this, getting this out into the light, to showing people what's going on out there. And thank you for the work that you do. Troy Martin is in here. An, I just want to let you know there is another good attorney in here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. There's a lot of good attorneys here as well that understand this. Thank you,